thank you so much for having me as well. It's really nice to, to be here. Um, so, everybody, you've already been introduced to me. My name's Andy, and um, as well as being a former agency founder, um, I sort of recently turned into leadership coaching. So I've been coaching, you know, dozens and dozens of, of design leaders and product leaders the last few years. Um, and it's through the practice of coaching and working with designers that kind of brought me onto this topic, which I've called design's midlife crisis. Um, before I jump in, I just want to give everyone a quick trigger warning. Um, some of the topics you might hear today might feel, make you feel a little bit nervous, agitated, a little bit queasy in your stomach. In some extreme cases, it might start to force you to question the meaning of your own existence. Um, if that happens, don't worry. Um, just put your head between your legs and it will all go away in about 20 or 30 minutes and you can carry on with your lovely uh, lives. Um, so with that warning um, out there, I'd like to jump in. Um, so I think um, the current growth in demand for design is, is really, really huge. I think actually, arguably, design is at the sort of peak of its influence. Teams are scaling, salaries are rising, and more and more designers are getting that hallowed seat at the table. Um, when I look around, we see articles in Harvard Business Review touting um, designers as the new MBAs, often thanks to the rise of design thinking and the success of design-led companies like Airbnb. Um, we also see reports like the McKinsey um, Design Effectiveness Report, and if any of you have seen it, showing how much better design-led companies are and how better they fare on the stock market than their non-design-led competitors. So is it any wonder that all the designers in the room are just feeling like on top of the world at the moment? We're really, really pumped. Oh, OK, maybe we're not really pumped. And in fact, this is not the, the sort of the temperature I'm getting when I talk to my designer friends. In fact, when I talk to my designer friends, they seem more stressed out, more disillusioned with design, and more pessimistic than probably any stage I've seen them in the design industry. And it got me so questioning, like, what's going on here? I think one reason is there's a big gap between what we've been taught to expect and believe about design and how the rest of the world sees us. And for many, it feels this gap is widening rather than shrinking. And in many instances, I think it might be. This starts from our own perceptions of what design is. We've grown up on a diet of lectures, books, articles, tweet storms, and conference presentations that set up this idealistic view of what our industry should be like. You'll see speakers at conferences and events um, tell you that you too can have the perfect design environment if you just follow these three simple steps, this five process, this trademarked kind of series of loops and twirls. Um, uh, all you need to do is do good design discovery. You just need to follow an agile process. You just need to start using OKRs. You just have to use design thinking. You just have to have a set of principles and a team charter, just a set of regular one-to-ones and maybe a design ladder that you, know, you saw earlier. And if you do these things, then you'll end up in this sort of perfect design practice, in this sort of design nirvana. So we go away from these talks and these conferences, and we try and put these things in practices. But they don't seem to work. They don't seem to solve the problems. And when that happens, we blame ourselves. Maybe we're not good enough. Maybe our colleagues aren't good enough. Maybe they're getting in the way. Um, maybe we blame the companies we work for. They just don't get it. They just don't get design. Um, they don't get the thing that's obvious to me. Because we know that UX lies at the heart of everything. It's at the heart of design and technology and business. It's the center of everything. And we know that the right way to design is to follow the process where we spend as much time doing research as we do coming up with possible solu solutions, and as much time doing research as we sort of do shipping. We've also been taught that it should be the designers rather than the business that decides what gets built based on user needs. So we get frustrated when our business partners tell us what to do and how to do it. As designers, we've been taught that in order to design the best products possible, we need to go and understand their context of use. This requires time to do research, to talk to customers, to run workshops and gather a big picture, to understand the problem, to understand the context we're working in. So we get frustrated when we get blocked from talking to customers or prevented from spending time exploring a dozen different options and approaches. We're user-centered, so naturally, we put users in the center of everything we do. And in fact, we often value user needs more than anything else. Above the needs of our colleagues, above the needs of the business we work in, we're user-centered. 
And this sets designers up as the arbiters of ethics. You know, we get really, really frustrated when things don't go our way, when the business wants to add a checkbox here or a button there. We're like, no, you know, we're the defenders of the faith for users. And in fact, I think we've come to believe that any trade-off between user needs and business needs is actually inherently unethical. And we regularly feel as designers like we're the last design, like the, the last line of defense. We're protecting the users from the evil business people that we work with. Fortunately, we've been taught about the power and impact design can have if the business would just listen to us. I'm sure we've grown up of stories around Jared Spall's $300 million button that shows that just a small few tweaks in design can make our companies millionaires, millions and millions of dollars. Or we've also grown up on these cautionary tales of Google and the 41 shades of blue. If, if you remember this, one of my friends, Doug Bowman, left Google in a huff because um, he wanted to come up with, a, I think it was like a link colour, and um, the Google engineers, the analytics people, wanted to test like 41 different shades to see which was the perfect shade. And as designers, this stuff frustrates us. We don't want to have to A-B test or multivariant test everything we do. And so these stories become folklore. And all of this underscores a set of beliefs that we hold to be true. But are these beliefs true? Are they serving us? Or maybe are they holding us back? Now, it's understandable why we centre UX as the most important role in the organisation. Because we truly believe what we're doing matters. It's why we chose to follow a career in design after all. Because we think design is really important. Maybe more important than business, maybe more important than technology, maybe important, more important than marketing. So of course we're going to centre UX. However, by centering ourselves on our own hero's journey, we position everybody else in the organisation that doesn't bind to our th thesis as a foe to be conquered or a challenge to be overcome. Nothing is more obvious to me in this tension than our relationship with marketing. Um, we often see marketing as corporate shills that are trying to force mediocre products into the hands of our customers. In fact, my friend um, John Wilshire um, coined this really brilliant term, make things people want, rather than make people want things. And this feels really true to us. When we, when we think about this sort of saying, of course we want to make, people, make things that people want. We want to build really, really valuable products. And the marketing people over here, they just, they just make people want things. And that's, that's lesser. That's not important. That's kind of, ugh. you know, the designers, we're the, the really good people here. But this sentiment can create a really toxic relationship between design and marketing. Um, it also sets up the false belief that all you need to do in order to be successful as a business is to make a great product. And it will eventually and essentially sell itself. This is known as the field of dreams fallacy after the, um, uh, the, the movie of the same title. In the movie, um, the protagonist gets visited by a vision that he has to go and build a, a baseball square in the middle of this field. And if he builds it, everyone will come. And obviously, because it's a Hollywood movie, he builds it. Everyone thinks he's crazy, but everyone comes. I've fallen for this fallacy myself for many years. You think that like, if you just build the perfect product, people will just turn up. And the reason I'm falling is because it panders to my own ego, my own sense of importance. However, as a startup advisor, I've seen many amazingly designed products that failed to take off because the people who needed them didn't know about them or couldn't be convinced to jump over the hurdle of the switching costs um, because of the endowment effect. Equally, I've seen some really appalling design products that sold like hotcakes, often to the annoyance of the design team because it solved a reasonable problem. The design team wanted to be proven that they were right and everyone else was wrong. And then suddenly, when it starts selling, they've got nothing to fall back on. The hard truth is that startups are often successful despite the quality of their early product rather than because of it, which sort of goes against everything we as designers have been taught to believe. A lot of this resolves around the maturity of your audience, obviously. If you're currently targeting early adopters, they're much more focused on removing the pain, irrespective of what the experience is like. Probably because the experience of how they're currently solving the problem is just so much worse. Um, I kind of joke that half of SaaS businesses are just like spreadsheets redesigned. 
But if you're having to navigate through a whole bunch of awful spreadsheets, if you've got a single product that does the job for you, even if it's a bit clunky and a bit messy, it's going to be better than the thing that went before. Now, obviously, as a market matures and as a product matures, you start attracting more risk-averse um, users. Users who are looking for a slicker experience. Users who are comparing the current experience to the experience that they, that they have. They start comparing different products, different services. And this is a point where sort of product quality starts to become much more important. As a result, we need to move away from this mistaken belief that it's our job as designers to create the best version of the product straight out of the gates when we're almost certainly over-optimizing. If you talk to engineers, there's this idea of like over-optimization. You, know, you build a system that can have 10 million concurrent users when you don't even have five users. You're kind of over-egging the pudding. I think we do this with design. Um, instead, our goal is to deliver the best quality product out of the door as quickly as possible, essentially optimizing around speed rather than perfection. And I'll come back to this concept a little bit later. The painful truth is that um, design doesn't really matter half as much as most designers think, especially in the early days of the product. Although my work as a startup advisor and investor, I've also come to the realization that um, marketing, uh, and particularly go-to-market strategy, often plays a much bigger role in the success of an early stage startup than we'd like to think. Um, although I also think um, that design is much more important than most company founders believe, so there's a, there's a balance there. I also see similar animosity between designers and product people, maybe even more so, because product managers are much more actively engaged in the needs of the business, which means they're much more likely to be going out trying to seek compromise. And often this compromise comes at the sake of design. We need to get this thing shipped quickly. We don't have time to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. We just need to get it launched. As such, I often um, argue that product management is the hardest job in tech. They're stuck in the middle of this impossible triangle, trying to get two groups of perfectionists to compromise in order to get something out the door and in the hands of customers before the company runs out of money. Um, I know it's not a job that I would want to take, although ironically I'm seeing a lot of designers moving into product management under the possibly mistaken belief that product managers have more influence. Um, this is hard to hear, but the reality is that designers aren't at the centre of anything. Instead, we're servants of the business, and one of a number of groups who are serving the business at that. The quicker we realize what our actual role is, rather than what our idealized role is, the quicker we can start delivering value to the places where we work. Another problem is that the double diamond, as wonderful it is, is largely a lie. In reality, design in most modern organizations looks like this. Very little research is actually undertaken, very little product exploration is actually done, Instead, all the efforts are focused around delivery. Now, I agree this isn't ideal, and I think we need to do better. I think we need to constantly pushing at the boundaries against this. However, if we fixate on the double diamond, if we think that this is the way that design should be, then we're going to be constantly disappointing ourselves. Whatever company you go into, whatever organisation we're helping, if our model is the previous model rather than this one, then we're always going to think that somehow things are broken. And if this happens, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. As such, if we judge our own sense of well-being against um, sort of movie stars, musicians, and social media influencers, um, we're going to be disappointed. And it's the same thing here. Like we need to judge our self-worth based on the reality of the situation, not some mythical ideal that's largely unattainable. I think a lot of this pressure comes from our belief that we're the voice of the customer, and that any product decision that gets made outside of the design team are by their nature ill-informed. As my friend Paul Adams said a few years ago at the UX, conference, UX London conference I used to run, we're a voice of the customer, but we're not the voice of the customer. In fact, we often have a lot less contact with our customers than our colleagues in sales and support, um, which is kind of scary. We think that we're the arbiters of, of the customer, but you go and talk to your peers in marketing, in sales, in, in CX, and they're talking to customers day in, day out. They're hearing their frustrations. They're hearing what they want. They're hearing what's not working and we're often not listening to them. So we need to do a much better job of engaging with our partners in sales and CX, especially if they have more power in the organization and more influence in the organization than designers do, which is usually the case. Another big frustration for designers comes from the belief that we should be deciding what gets built. And we get super frustrated when other parts of the business tells us what to build. 
Um, this is especially true when sales tells us that their customers have been asking for this. And we come up with some anecdote, like the time a focus group were asked to um, uh, pick a particular color of phone. I think it was like maybe Nokia or something. They spread out like six or seven phones, like, which color do you like? And everyone's like, I want the green, I want the red, you know, the blue. And then at the end of the session, they stacked up all the phones on, on the way out and said, you know, take whichever color you want. And everyone picked black. Like, these are the kind of stories we tell because we know that what customers say they want isn't always what they actually want. I I'm not saying that um, we wouldn't do a better job deciding what gets built. I personally believe we would. It's just that this isn't how most companies are organised. And when you're not going to make a lot of friends, or sorry, and you're not going to make a lot of friends when you dismiss the requests from your peers. Um, so instead, we need to do a much better job of listening to what our, C our COO argues for or what our, our sales you know, people argue for. Um, and we need to do a much better job of working around existing structures rather than fixating on ideal models that don't currently exist. Um, as Erica Hall said, it doesn't matter how good your data is if you haven't done the groundwork to ensure an evidence-based framework for making decisions is in place before you do the work of gathering the evidence. And I think we do this all the time as designers. We go out there and we gather the evidence and we present it to people who don't care about this stuff. We've kind of fundamentally missed the first step of, of laying the groundwork. As a result of all this, we often find ourselves in something that's dismissively called the feature factory. We're on a conveyor belt where we have very little personal agency and other parts of the organization just throwing things on the conveyor belt telling us to build it. And like I say, this goes against everything we've been taught about how design works and it's super frustrating. Um, it's especially frustrating because you know we've been told that it's our job to build the best product possible. However, there's an opportunity cost here. Businesses want to get the products in the hands of their customers as fast as possible so they can start making money as fast as possible. So any delays leaves money on the table. This is why businesses like to promise, you know, like the promise of Agile, even if it rarely works in the way it's intended. The idea that you can continuously be shipping value rather than doing things in large releases. If you're doing things in like three months or six months releases rather than little weekly updates, you've got all this value that you're missing from the market. And I think as designers, this is a lot of the frustration that our business partners have with us, is they see us leaving all this money on the table and they're like, what are you doing? As designers, we often find Agile to be super frustrating. Um, it doesn't give us enough time to do proper research and discovery. Um, we rarely get to understand the broadest context of the design, you know, the bigger picture. Um, and we want to build the best product possible, but the Agile process gets in the way. For the longest time, I've blamed the Agile process for this. However, I'm increasingly coming to the belief that Agile isn't the problem at all. Um, I mean, it's a problem, but it's not the problem. Um, Instead, I think Agile is just incompatible with the, the, the designer's natural tendency for perfection. And maybe it's that tendency for perfection that's causing the problem here. In truth, perfect is the enemy of good. And we'll always be frustrated if we're constantly chasing some un unobtainable ideal. Indeed, um, we need to learn that our role and isn't and has never been to deliver the perfect product. Instead, our role is to ship the best solution possible with the limited time and the limited resources we have available, which means that speed and pragmatism always trump idealism and perfectionism. As my friend Stuart Clark um, of Deliveroo rightly points out, great design work at the strategic level is a set of compromises rather than an idealized design vision. And this is the most difficult thing for senior practitioners to wrap their head around when they're moving into a leadership role. And it's weird because so many designers I, I speak to keep telling me they want to focus on the strategic element. But they believe that they want to focus on the strategic element because it's this pure thing that hasn't, doesn't have to get in touch with the reality of the organization when it's completely opposite. Strategy is a series of tactical compromises in most organizations. And this, this runs largely counter to everything we've learned and believe. And worse, because it's the focus on quality that got us to this point in our career, it is a real inhibitor, inhibitor to us making the next leap into leadership. Um, so one of the things we need to learn is that what got us to where we are now as designers isn't actually going to serve us well when we move into the next phase of leadership. And actually is probably going to be sabotaging our efforts. Possibly more importantly, changing perfection just risks our own mental health and our collective sense of well-being. I can't tell you the number of times that um, 
a design team I've been working with have launched a product, and rather than feeling a sense of jubilation, they feel depressed, disappointed. They look at the work that they, they released, and to everyone else in the organization, they're seeing something that's so much better, a thing that's like 80% better than what came before it. Like The thing was rubbish before, and they're seeing this 80%, this amazing improvement. As designers, we don't see the 80%. We see the 20% we missed out. We see the 20% that we couldn't get to unless you know, we'd had more time, we'd had more research. Those marketing people, those sales people, those business people just stopped us from making it perfect. And what happens is every single release we make, every single thing we ship, we see what's missing. And we do that two times, three times, four times in an organization, and we just wound down. And we're like, we can't work here. They just don't get it. I'm going to go somewhere else. And then we go somewhere else, and the same thing happens again, but we get upset by different people in different contexts, and we keep going around and around in circles. Um, this is just not good for our mental health. You know, as a result, when launch day comes, like you'd imagine it would be a celebration, but actually it feels more like a wake. You're looking around going, you've done great work, and everyone's sitting there thinking, you know, you know, what have we done? What's the purpose? Why are we here? Everyone feels like really, really angsty and depressed. Why did they even bother if the, if the company's not going to listen to them? And this is one of the things that's led me to this belief that we're suffering from some collective existential crisis. That many of the things we've been taught to believe about the world of design have failed to materialise. Some have even been proven to be frankly not true. We're not at the centre of the design process. We're not doing enough design research. We're not driving product discovery. And we're unhappy about the quality of the work we produce on a day-to-day -day basis. Under these circumstances, is it any wonder why so many designers I speak to feel confused, frustrated, and lost, um, and are starting to question the direction they've taken, the decisions they've made, and the value of their work? This sounds like a midlife crisis to me. Now, here's a classic list of the symptoms of a midlife crisis. I'm speaking to a lot of designers at the moment who are experiencing one or more of these symptoms. I'll just have a little sip of tea while you, uh, you digest these. And particularly seeing things like you know, a sense of nostalgia. Oh, wasn't it better 20 years ago when Andy was blogging and talking about UX and everything was so simple? You know, when before product managers, before we had to worry about making money, um, you know, now it's all kind of like, oh, it's angsty. You know, I'm bored, I'm feeling kind of restless, I'm feeling irritable. Maybe I'm going to switch careers. Maybe I'm going to go into product management. Sod it, maybe I'm going to open a bike shop or a coffee shop. Like, I'm done with this industry. This is, blah. you know, I'm seeing so many people having these conversations. Um, I felt this sense of ennui um, most viscerally at a conference in 2017, um, uh, the Interaction 17 in New York City. Trump had just been elected in a wave of social media hatred. Misinformation was spreading like wildfire. We were all worried about tech addiction and filter bubbles. Every third talk at this conference was about responsibility and ethics. It was like the whole interaction design community had taken a long, hard look at itself and found it wanting. I'm actually getting very similar vibes like that at the moment, like with the whole kind of, you know, chaos that's happening with Twitter, a lot of, you know, a lot of companies kind of, you know, reneging on their deals. Like we're going through this weird kind of existential kind of group crisis. Um, similar to sort of what happened during Black Lives Matter, like a lot of designers woke up thinking, hold on, has the system we've created actually been part of the problem? Have we baked institutional biases into the, the spaces we work, into the algorithms, into the interfaces? And a lot of people have been starting to question their role in what we've been built. Like we wanted to build something better for the universe, but actually, have we succeeded? Have we actually built something that's maybe worse? It's natural for people to go through some kind of midlife crisis or mid-career crisis, looking back at their careers to understand the impact they've had individually on the world. You know, what are they leaving for future generations? I think this is the same that's going on with our industry at the moment. Well, a lot of people are experiencing this midlife crisis, you know, a, a regular midlife crisis. They look to spirituality for answers about some kind of like the meaning of life, big picture, fundamental questions. I think the design industry has looked towards the field of ethics largely to provide them with frameworks for how they can make better decisions and really um, align their values with the impact they want to have on the world. So as designers, how can we use our design skills to have a more positive impact? 
How can we avoid baking bias into the systems we create? How can we push back when we're asked to do things we're uncomfortable with, um, like deploying dark patterns? How can we create more equity and avoid creating vectors for abuse? These are just some of the questions that the design industry is starting to ask itself, finally. Um, thankfully, there are a ton of interesting people out there talking and writing about this space at the moment. So I urge you, if it's something that's interesting, to kind of follow some of these people, follow the conversation, follow the dialogue. One way designers have been approaching this problem is to learn the language of business in order to gain more influence on how work gets done and how decisions get made. Um, I'm seeing a slow but steady number of designers undertake MBAs for this very reason. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for designers gaining more fluency in business. In fact, um, this is one of the reasons why I've spent this past sort of you know, year or two um, helping business leaders in the, the VC space. Um, not only do we need more designers on the board of companies, I think we need more designers starting companies, I think we need designers funding companies, I think we need designers advising companies. Um, if we really want to have design to have the impact we believe, and we're finding ourselves in situations and structures which aren't allowing that, the only real way to do it is to own those structures, to invest in those structures, to make those structures, to found those structures. So if you are a designer that's wanting to sort of start exploring entrepreneurship because they're fed up of where they are and they want to create businesses and products that have a design focus, please do reach out, let's chat, I'd, I'd love to help you there. Um, one of the interesting things I find is when um, you start hanging out with business people, actually how aligned their thinking is with our thinking. MBAs teach the importance of understanding user needs and delivering products that meet those users' expectations. The main problem isn't that our bosses don't care. I think the main problem is that executives don't realise how designers think and how aligned our thinking is with their thinking. And I believe this is because, and I'm sorry to say this, we've done a terrible job of communicating this. Um, we need to do a much better job of building relationships with our executives, demonstrating how we think, and more importantly, demonstrating how we could help them achieve their goals. However, the majority of executives don't want to have some designer coming in and educating them. In fact, like this is a problem. Whenever I speak to a lot of my coaching clients, like their first thing is like, you know, I need to, I need to tell my bosses how it is. I'm going to do a really big PowerPoint deck, and I've been given 10 minutes at the, the, the annual meeting, and I'm going to give this PowerPoint deck, and my executives are going to love me. They're going to be like, I never knew how amazing design was, and they're going to carry me out of the meeting room on their shoulders going, thank you, you've saved my business. So they go into these meetings thinking that like this 10-minute PowerPoint deck is going to change everything. But they don't actually explain how design is going to help the business. They're going to say, well, Jared Spall said this, and, and you know, you've got to understand the theory over here. And, and, you know, and you start giving all these really, really obtuse theoretical impassioned but but non-practical examples and the, and the leadership team oh that's great from a theoretical point of view I get it I get it I get it but actually the CTO has just said that they need five more engineers next week so we can ship this feature that we've promised our shareholders so you know lovely lovely you know rousing speech we're gonna hire five more designers uh, five more engineers and the designers like what did you not hear my rousing speech we need to give less rousing speeches and we need to start working and applying our kind of empathy. Um, as Daniel Berker, my friend Daniel Berker, eloquently explained, we need to stop trying to sell design and instead start to demonstrate the value design can have for other people. Because while selling the value design can work, it's often much more effective to show rather than tell. And this is one of the reasons why I like design sprints. Not because they're a way of shortcutting the longer process, but because they're a great way of bringing executives into the design process. I've done so many design sprints where executives have come in not really understanding design because they go away, they say, okay, design team, go away and build this. It, it comes back three months later, it's miraculously built, and they don't see any of the process. Bring them into a, a one-week design sprint, and they suddenly start seeing how it's all put together, how the sausage is made, how the kind of like the, the bread is baked. They get to understand, oh, so you do this research thing, you go out and you do this sketching and blah. And I've, I've seen so many executives like come round to the power of design by being invited to Design Sprint. I've also seen this happen as well for inviting executives to research sessions. 
you know, get a live research, you know, two-way mirror or video stream, have the users start using the product. The first time the users start using the product and, and hit a, a roadblock, the executives and the engineers are like, well, where did you get this stupid user from? Like, they don't understand our product. And the next one comes in, has the same problem. They're like, wow, you've got two idiots in a row. <laughs> By the end of the day, when they've seen half a dozen or a dozen people struggle with the interface, struggle with the ideas that they ask you to go and build, suddenly a light bulb goes on and they're like, oh, maybe we're the problem here. Maybe we're the ones that aren't really thinking. You know, go, go and do more research, go and do more research. These tools are often more political than they are design tools, but we need to start being political if we're going to make the impact that we want. We need to be better politicians. Um, this is also one of the reasons why I hate, really, really hate the design industry's unhealthy and potential self-destructive mistrust of Net Promoter Score. Um, this is one of the areas I, I, I align with a lot of Jared's thinking, but this is one of the areas that we massively disagree on. Sure, it's a stupid metric that's calculated in a super weird way. It's also a metric that's regularly gained by teams. But it's a metric that a very large number of businesses use to measure customer sentiment. And that isn't changing anytime soon. No, no matter the number of like angry tweets that we s send to our other design friends, our bosses, our marketing executives, our CEOs are not going to be changing their mind anytime soon. However, it's also one of the tools that we can still use to influence senior stakeholders because they care about this stuff. Um, I remember kind of working um, with an executive team and it was their kind of like annual strategy day. And at the start of the day, like the, the, the boss, the CEO, has said like, you know, our goal this quarter is to increase our net promoter score by X, like, you know, 0.2%, 0.5%. Because this was a company that was a really, really customer-centric brand, and they felt that the way to do customer centricity is to increase their net promoter score. An hour or so later, they're planning a feature that is going to massively annoy their customers. And the simple thing I said to them, like, they were, look, they were working at this feature, and I was like, okay, this feature's great. Like, how, many, how much net promoter score are you willing to lose by putting this feature? And they were like, what do you mean? It's like, well, look, this feature is really frustrating. It was a checkout flow. And basically, halfway through the checkout flow, they wanted to do a pop-up to do an upsell. It was like, great, OK, so you could make maybe this upsell, maybe make a million pounds extra. Is making a million pounds worth tanking your commitment to customer experience? Well, clearly not. I've just said, like, an hour ago, we're committed to increasing the net promoter score. We're not going to do anything that's going to affect that net promoter score. It's like, well, there you go then. This idea that might make you a million pounds, this is a very big company, so a million pounds wasn't an awful lot. Um, you shouldn't be doing it. It was like, no, you're right. Just the realisation of how certain requests or features might have an effect on a thing they cared about was enough to stop them from doing this thing. It can be a really powerful tool. Um, now, like I said earlier, like I think a lot of designers are starting to think about doing MBAs, but you don't have to do an MBA to, to understand sort of business fluency. It just requires us to apply our research skills to our business partners, to learn what they truly value and to take an active part in delivering what they value. And it's not rocket science. Most businesses only really care about five things. They care about acquiring new customers. They care about retaining those customers. They care about engaging those customers. They care about the customer satisfaction. And they care about the cost to service those customers. These are all things that designers have a big part to play on, a big influence. And so we need to do a much better job of when these conversations come up, we need to be in the room and we need to be explaining to our business partners how design can, can actively improve these areas, because it can in all of these areas. Now, I appreciate a lot of designers are suspicious of having to demonstrate ROI, especially when our colleagues in engineering aren't held to the same standard. It feels unfair. Um, I used to joke that companies don't need to justify their ROA of, of janitors. Like, so why should designers expect to justify their ROA, ROI? Um, but the answer is quite simple. If design is happy to be viewed as a cost center, i.e. the inevitable cost of doing business, like hiring cleaners, we don't need to justify our value. We just get on with it. But if we want to um, have new designers join the team, we're going to have to fight for every single person because they don't see the value in adding another cost to the business. The reason we're all in this situation is because we haven't effectively demonstrated how design is a profit centre. And a profit centre is a group you invest in to deliver more value. We need to be able to demonstrate 
to our bosses that for every design, every dollar you give design, they'll get five dollars back. If we can effectively demonstrate that tie between value, um, we're going to be um, in a good place. This might seem a little bit theoretical, but this is exactly what my friend Stuart Frisbee did when he joined Booking.com. He joined Booking.com when the design team was five people. Five years later, he'd grown the team to 100. The way he'd grown the team to 100 is the first couple of projects he did on a five-person team, he mapped how much it was costing, how much it was making the company. And he showed that it was giving them $5 for every dollar they spent. If you go to your CEO and say, you give me a dollar, I'll turn it into five, they're going to keep throwing money at you. In fact, he got to the point where he actually started having to say to the CEO, look, stop giving me more money. Like, I, we can't spend it fast enough. Um, that is the power of proving the value that design can have. We're just generally bad at it. Business generally looks on designers on the execution level because we behave like executors. This is really what people mean when they talk about learning the language of business. It's not about knowing a particular three-letter acronym. It's about moving from an, exec uh, from an execution mindset to an ownership mindset and focusing on impact over delivery. Now, I think one of the problems is that a lot of designers live in this world of abundance. We know that if we were given the right amount of time, we'd be able to find the perfect solution. In fact, I was chatting earlier to someone that says, like, well, no, you know, we're in, we're in a bit of a downturn at the moment. But businesses need to realise that, like, in a downturn, if you invest more money, things go well. It's like, aha, yeah, you're right. In a downturn, if you invest more money, you generally do better. Except if you don't have the money to invest because you're in a downturn. We kind of live in this sort of magical thinking world where like suddenly, even though we've cut half of the engineering team, we suddenly imagine that there's all this free money flowing around. Well, there isn't. We need to get out of this abundance mindset and realise the challenge that our business peers are facing. Because our business peers live in a world of limited resources and competing demands, where they're going out of business permanently next month, the month after. They're scared, they're frustrated, they're not in this world of abundance. There's no point investing in larger initiatives that will pay something out in three years or five years if you ain't going to be around at the end of this quarter. So a lot of the time, a lot of the motivation from our business partners comes from this need to deliver short-term value. As such, most businesses look to make lots of small bets, knowing full well that many of those small bets will fail. But when one of those bets succeeds, they'll double down. And this is in stark contrast to most designers who want to de-risk projects by doing the research, exploring more options, validating every idea before launch. Weirdly, us designers are quite risk averse. I'm not saying that's wrong, by the way. I'm just saying this is not how business people think, especially in times like now of limited resources. So ultimately, I think what's happening is designers, we're playing chess. Our business partners are playing poker. Chess is a game where if you are better, if you are smarter, if you know the process, you can win every single time. We're playing games of chess. But our business partners are playing games of poker. They're playing lots of bets. They know that many of them will fail, but they're putting little bets and little bets and little bets. And when something works, they put a whole bunch of big money on the table. We need to get better at playing poker. We need to stop playing chess. And like I say, a lot of this comes down to budgeting and opportunity costs. Getting something out the door quickly allows you to start driving revenue sooner. Most businesses see sales and marketers as the driving of revenue. So in order for designers to be seen as more than just a cost to be managed, we need to demonstrate how can we constantly be driving revenue as well. And this is one of the reasons why I'm personally fascinated by the growth design community. Um, a group of designers who are very focused on understanding analytics, making small changes, making small tweaks, measuring the effect of those changes in order to constantly make incremental improvements. If a design um, growth design team can improve one metric by like 1% every week, that compound interest has massive effects. So while product designers tend to focus on the larger chunks of the product and are responsible for delivering longer term value, um, this value sadly goes unnoticed. Whereas the growth designers are constantly making these small little changes, these improvements get noticed and they, they, they compound and they're identifiable. And they're things we can point to. 
There's a super vibrant growth design community out there. If you're interested in the field of growth design, um, check out the growth design website. They've got um, Slack community. They've got um, events. They've got jobs boards. They've got you know training. There are a bunch of really good books out there. UX for growth designers, design-driven growth, better onboarding. These are all the kind of the tools and techniques that growth designers use to, 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 to crank up the dial. Um, there's also a lot more traditional business books. Again, we talk about like wanting to learn the language of business. If we want to learn the language of business, we need to read the same books that our peers are reading. We need to understand the idea of crossing the chasm. If any of you haven't read Crossing the Chasm, or at least read a kind of a summary of Crossing the Chasm, it's the, this idea that like, the real challenge that startups face is moving from the early adopters who are willing to put up with any old rubbish to moving to the sort of the later majority of, of customers that are much more focused on quality. And it's jumping across this chasm that's really important. We need to look at books like Blitzscaling, which is looking at the stories of your Amazons and your Netflix and how they grew at huge scale. And if you're growing really, really fast, you don't have the time to sit around and debate the, the, the ethics, not the ethics, the, 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 um, the the rationale of doing long um, sort of level research. And The Cold Start Problem. Cold Start Problem is a really, really fantastic book. Andrew Chen um, is focusing on kind of um, growth and how you grow um, products to be valuable businesses. And as designers, we need to start reading books like The Cold Start Problem. So, whew, a lot of stuff there. What does this all mean? So first off, I think we need to stop complaining about being misunderstood. I think we need to stop finding excuses and blaming other people. Blaming marketing, blaming sales, blaming product management. And instead, we need to take an active role in raising the profile and the impact of design. To do this, we, not, we need to stop centering ourselves in the conversation, as this only comes across as self-centered and egotistical and kind of needy. And we need to realize that we're one of a number of a supporting cast. We're not at the center of anything. As Paul Adams rightly says, the next evolution of UX is to understand where we sit in the organization and the role we play. We need to stop fixating over idealized processes or worrying whether we're doing it wrong, but rather accept the current reality. That doesn't mean not pushing for change. It doesn't mean settling, but it does mean um, lowering our overly high levels of expectation and moving things forward slowly but practically. It also means not beating ourselves up when we can't be perfect and, and can't deliver perfection every time. We need to do a much better job of demonstrating the value we can bring by showing rather than telling. But we also need to realize that we're on a journey and we're optimizing for the long haul. This means getting comfortable with shipping imperfect solutions because the product will get better over time. We need to realize that the products we're building isn't the sprint or the version that we're building now. We're building products that will last five, six, seven years. And the ultimate goal is to build the perfect product, but over a much longer time period. Um, and if we can do all this, um, not only will we have learned our, earned our seat at the table, but hopefully it won't be a child's chair. Hopefully it'll be a grown-up's chair. Um, so that's me done. Thank you very much. I don't know if we're doing questions. Yeah, we'll do questions. OK, so uh, the first question is uh, from Ondra. And uh, he's asking how to measure design efficiency. What is the good ratio between design and development, or how to decide when it makes sense to do another iteration or not? I mean, one of the challenges with these kind of questions is I think a lot of the time, we're hoping that there's some magic answer. We're hoping, oh, we've got Andy here. And he'll, he'll give me this sort of magical incantation. He'll give me this perfect formula, and everything will be solved. Well, I'm sorry, but there's no perfect answer. There's no one number that I can give you that will suddenly make everything better. Um, all of these things are conversations. They're, they're dependent on the organization you work for, what they value, the culture, the, the, the values of engineering, design, product, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no uh, easy answer to that question. I mean, a slightly, because you talk about efficiency, a slightly different question or answer to a slightly different question is that generally there's been research that shows um, 
that for every sort of five to six to seven engineers you have, you probably need one designer. If you want to be considered to be a design-focused company, like f five to eight engineers for every one designer is a, is a nice size. I come across organizations that have three or four engineers for every designer. They're, they're doing really good. They've got enough research and resource to deliver great value. I've come across teams where there's one designer to 20 engineers, and that is really, really tough. And it's all very well me coming here and talking about like demonstrating the value of design. There's a double-edged sword, or there's kind of a, a, a chicken and egg problem, which is you can only demonstrate the value of design if you have enough spare time to go and track the numbers and um, monitor the numbers and feed them back. If you're that one designer on a team of 20 people, you're just not going to have that capacity so it's really really difficult in terms of efficiency again i mean it depends on what you're talking about um in the agency world um it's quite easy to measure efficiency because what you're doing you're selling time and a lot of agencies will have some figure around kind of like 70 to 90 percent chargeable time if you're working in a in a, in a crappy agency it'll be at the higher end if you work in a really crappy agency, it would be 120%. People are expecting you to do more work than they're actually available in the hours. But I think kind of like if you don't want to kind of like completely destroy your team's energy, I think, you know, if you're doing three days out of five of actual practical design work, the other two days is learning, it's meetings, it's one-to-ones, it's kind of design op stuff. That's a kind of nice balance. Um, in terms of, again, efficiency, I mean, it depends what you mean by efficiency. I think... There are some engineering teams that will measure velocity. And I think you can measure velocity as a designer. You know, you can do your t-shirt sizes or your planning poker. Um, but again, I think the challenge with that is like you're measuring output, you're not measuring value. So I actually would argue in a weird kind of way, if you're measuring efficiency, you're measuring the wrong thing. If you're measuring efficiency, you're measuring how quickly the cleaners clean the toilet. And, you know, if that's where we want to be, if that's how we want to be perceived as an efficient, like, we'll get the, we get the toilet cleaning done and then we'll be out. That's the wrong question to ask. Actually, it doesn't really matter how efficient we are if we're delivering value. If we're turning that $1 into $5, that's the only thing we need to be measuring. Like, if, if it takes us, you know, it takes us longer to do that, then that's, that's built into the $1, $5 equation. If we're taking $10 to deliver $5, then we're broken. So that's kind of where I would focus on. I would focus on outcomes over outputs. I would focus on value we're delivering, and I'd sort of move away from the efficiency of moving the pixels around. Because basically what we're saying is, like, how can we assemble the thing on the factory line faster? And that's not, I think, where we want design to, to be. Mm -hmm. I might elaborate a bit on this, because uh, I, I find it interesting. Um, because I can imagine that it's pretty easy to... Uh, measure the velocity or, or, or the speed with which you produce things and it's probably much harder to measure the business value that you are producing. Uh, so um, where to start when you are, for example, right now you are just measuring this efficiency, where to start when you want to move away from this? Yep. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, there's the old adage, you know, you, you, you manage what you can measure. And I think if it's really easy to measure efficiency, then we measure efficiency. But then if we measure efficiency, we are managed and judged by efficiency and we kind of build ourselves into a hole. Um, I think what you have to do is you're probably not, if you're a team of five, if you're my friend Stuart's like, point of view, you're not going to come in and you're not going to measure the value that every single person is delivering. But what you can do is you can tactically find a project that is going to be two or four weeks. You can talk to the, the product manager who owns the KPIs. You can talk to the analytics team. Let's say at Booking.com, I can't remember what it was that he would have done, but let's say, you know, um, Booking.com are notorious for like pop-up notifications and things, you know. So you can show, well, like actually, if we do this notification, this, um, this increases you know, sign up rate by half a percent. And half a percent spread over a year is five million dollars. And actually it only cost us, you know, three weeks, four weeks of the project team, their salaries, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That is, you know, five thousand, fifty thousand dollars. Therefore we can say that, you know, 
six weeks worth of work delivered this amount of value. Like, it's not rocket science. I think the other problem is, like, and th this is a th thing that really, really annoys me. Uh, many things annoy me. You've probably seen today. But, like, if you're in any business meetings, like, marketing teams, engineering teams, sales teams will pull figures out of their asses. The boss will go, like, okay, what, what, you know, what are our Q2 targets? And the salesperson will, like, you know, confidently say, well, we think the Q2, Q4 targets are going to be up 25%. That's great. Brilliant. And then you decide, what designer, what, what do you, oh, I couldn't possibly say. It's like, it's really difficult. And, you know, I don't really like, you know, I, I need to go away and do a whole bunch of stuff. It's like, we're just really shy about making up numbers. I'm not suggesting, like, lie. But we just need to be comfortable going, like, we think, you know, we know design. We know, you know, if we feel that, uh, you know, I see so many designers go, like, well, that user flow is awful. It's like, well, great, okay, if it's awful, and you fix it, estimate how much better you think it will be. We need to get confident in saying, well, actually, yeah, I think if we do this, you know, we're going to con conservatively maybe uplift by 5%. If we're really lucky, 20%. Okay, great. Let's say it's going to be roughly 10%. How long do you think it will take you? Uh, take about a month. Great. Okay. How much business do we throw through this checkout? Well, it's okay. Is it okay. Well, there you go. We think if we spend four weeks on this, we're going to get this kind of, you know, this kind of uplift. The secret is no, no one's ever going to check. The CEO isn't going to come back and, you know, do the sums because they don't do the sums anything else. So we just need to be a little bit confident about kind of like having the same kind of um, business conversations that other business partners do. And when we don't, you know, basically, if you've got marketing saying, yeah, you give me a million pounds and I'll turn it into five million. Great. And if you say to the engineering team, like, well, we've got to we've got to hit this deadline. You give me a million extra pounds. We'll hit the deadline. Great. What, you know, what are you going to do, designer? Oh, well, I, I want to hire another designer. I want to do some research. I want to kind of understand. Oh, God, you know, like. We go, we're going to go and give the money to engineering and marketing because they've given me a really good answer. We need to stop being wet, basically. Thank you. Thank you. How do you see a relationship between a product management, product managers and designers? What's an ideal setup of cooperation here? I, th I think this is a really interesting question. I think it's also a problematic question. Like, about four or five years ago, I was asked by Envision, you know, some of you, you might not be old enough to remember Envision, there used to be a design tool before Figma came out. Um, and then they crashed their, um, their credibility and Figma blew up. Um, but, but three or four or five years ago, they were kind of really big. And so they asked me to go around to a bunch of European countries to host a bunch of dinners with design leaders to talk about subjects. So one of the subjects they were talking about, like the, the animosity and the tension between engineering and design. I was like, okay, you know, so I asked the question, like, so, you know, how are people feeling, designers in the room, how are you feeling about engineers? You know, and everyone's like, yeah, no, engineers are cool, like, we get on with engineers now. You know, it was a bit challenging three or four years ago, but engineering now is great. It's like, well, what's changed? It's like, well, we all hate the product managers. So now we can bond, the engineers and the designers, we've got something to bond about because we can all be shitty about the product managers. So, like, okay, so we get this. So there is a real tension at the moment between, between design and product. Um, I don't think there has to be. Um, I think the, the challenge is, I think a lot of designers are very similar. A lot of product managers are very different. Product managers come from a whole range of different backgrounds. You get product managers that are project managers. You get product managers that are BAs. You get product managers that are MBAs, that are like, you know, money, you know, kind of like spreadsheet focused. You get product managers that are engineers that are really kind of like scrum masters. And you get product managers that have an understanding of design or maybe even come from design. So I think the relationship you have with your product manager really depends on the type of product manager they are and the type of organization you are. I firmly believe that if you work with a really, really good product manager in a, in a, in a really, really well-functioning team that has a trifecta, that has engineering leadership, design leadership, and product leadership working together in collaboration, it can be the best relationship possible. I think if you have a product leader who acts like the CEO of the product and tells you all what to do and expects you to go away and deliver it, it can be incredibly frustrating and, and, and energy sapping. So again, there's no easy answer. I think it's so dependent on the organization and the type of leader you have. Um, I am seeing a lot of designers move into product leadership and do it really well. Um, because a lot of the skills that they have in understanding customer needs, prioritizing, running workshops, et cetera, are also the kind of skills you need to be a really successful product leader or product manager. So, um, yeah, if you work with someone like that, they can be amazing. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, I'll scroll down to other questions we have here. 
Um, okay. Uh, we have a question from Alex, uh, and he's asking, uh, what areas of your work or personal development are you hoping to explore further? What is fun for you? <laughs> well, the areas that I am wanting to explore further is this question here. So I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to ignore that question, Peter. Oh, sorry, I'm going to ignore that question, Alex, and I'm going to jump straight to okay. Peter's question. Because I think AI is really fascinating. Um, I, if any of you have seen the stuff that's going on with DALI 2, if any of you have seen the stuff that's going on with, um, oh God, my, my brain's not working, sorry? Yeah, all, all of those kind of sort of AI um, kind of, you know, generative uh, framework, it's fascinating. If you were to talk to a, a, an illustrator a couple of years ago and say, like, could you ever imagine a time when a, a computer could build a really, really credible version of what you do based on a couple of sentences? They go, no, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing art. You know, there's no way that any computer could ever kind of do this. I feel really, really safe in my job. Now, if you're a photographer, if you're an illustrator, like, it's, it's going to get tough in the next few years because, like, why would I go and commission a, um, a you know, a, a, a five thousand pound, twenty thousand pound series of, of of illustrations when I go into Mid Journey, type a couple of sentences in, and I get exactly what I want? Actually, I don't even get exactly what I want. I get fifty versions of it. Like, you go to a designer, you're lucky to get three. So I get fifty versions. I can pick the right thing. I think the exact same thing will inevitably happen to our industry. And actually, I think it's already happening. And I think this is also the frustration why people are frustrated with product managers. Product managers are effectively manipulating an AI at the moment. They're just called designers. Um, eventually, they won't need to manipulate us as designers anymore because they'll have an interface they can do this all with. So, I mean, this is, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing um, plugins to things like AutoCAD that will do generative design whereby you can plug in a bunch of engineering tolerances for a plane, for instance, and it will spit out the perfect design of a plane. And it will look weird and it'll look funky. It won't look like any plane we've ever seen. It won't be any plane that any designer could have imagined to, to done. But it would be the perfect flying vehicle because all of the various inputs have been, been judged. Um, you know, we have so much data about how people flow through systems. You know, we think it's impossible to kind of like put a bunch of boxes together to, to kind of design a checkout. Like that's really hard work. But, you know, Google has indexed all of these flows. You know, it's not a million miles away to take that training data in, to spit out 15 different user flows um, and go, yeah, there you go. And then, you know, develop, you know, um, you know a, a dozen different kind of design systems, plug the two together and you've got an infinite variety. I don't think it's sort of beyond um, the realms of possibility. So I think this is a direction we are heading into. Um, I don't think we're heading into it anytime soon, but I think, you know, give it 20 years, I think the role of the designer will be, will be quite, quite different. Um, and so I think, you know, it's an area that we need to be aware of, which is another reason why I think a designer should move into product management, because I think the craft skills will become less and less important. I mean, we're there already. If you are a designer, you go and work in a, in, a, in, a, in a large company, you're not designing anything from scratch. You're going to a repo of a design language. You're getting a whole bunch of Lego blocks and you're plugging them together. Um, you know, you, there are still designers that are building zero to one products, but actually you go to Bubble and you knock it out, you know, you know, um, a, you know a web flow type interface or, a, you know, um, we, we are now starting to be people who assemble and, um, and, and that's challenging. That doesn't mean that there won't be a role for designers, but I do think that we will end up being um, editors. A, a friend of mine, uh, Lissandra um, Foyet, um, was uh, one of the designers at Nike. He designed the US Olympic running team's um, football boots, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, track and field boots, beautiful boots. He didn't, he's a designer, but he didn't do it in CAD, he did it by programming it. Like I say, he programmed the, the different weights of each each athlete, the, the 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 friction on the on the track, the rain. He pressed a button, it spread out fifty different designs. His job then was to look at the designs and go, that one's a bit weird, that one doesn't quite work, that one is is lovely. And my job is to kind of to be a tastemaker. So I think we're gonna start seeing more and more of that. And I want that to be designers doing that rather than product managers, or at least designers that become product managers. So um, I think it's going to get. I think it's get really interesting. I mean, you know, Adobe have a bunch of kind of AI kind of helpers 
in Photoshop, I think, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years, we're going to start seeing those make their way into Figma and other tools. Um, yeah, I'm already seeing, you know, there are already tools out there that will will design simple interfaces and interactions auto, auto magically. So I don't think we're too far away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, and I think this was uh, a perfect ending, a look into the future. Uh, so Andy, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was really an inspiring talk, and uh, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers.